Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome on this glorious morning. We have a blue candle lit today alongside our Christ candle as we keep the conflict in Israel and Palestine in our prayers. In the midst of troubled times, we look for light and for beauty around us and in other people close by and around the world. We keep hope alive. We welcome those who have gathered here in this place this morning, and we acknowledge with gratitude that we are worshiping on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral peoples. As Anabaptists, we strive to walk in the ways of peace, reconciliation, and justice with all peoples and with God's good creation. And so we acknowledge the significance of this physical place where we find ourselves and the history that it holds. As a worshiping community, we are not only in this place here at Wellesley Mennonite Church, but we're also in other places, connected through the internet to neighbors and potentially to the other side of the world. So welcome to those who are connecting to this gathering from other places as well. And a reminder that you're invited to join us for any of our congregational activities during the week or to reach out to our church office if you'd like to have a conversation with one of our pastors. A few announcements as we begin this morning. Children, there is an activity table at the back that's there for you, for you to use during the service if you would like to. After worship today, we'll have coffee and then Christian Education Hour. There will be a couple of different things going on today. There's a meeting in the boardroom for new members with Pastor Kara and the elders. And secondly, we'll be meeting here in the auditorium for a sermon discussion time, the topic being sometimes learning is hard. What hard lessons have you learned on your faith journey? Now, are there life lessons that you've had to unlearn in order to live faithfully? So I'd plan to join us for that. A few other things. This afternoon from 2 to 5 is the Celebration of Fun event in memory of John Schultz at Poole Mennonite Church. There'll be entertainment, hot dogs, his favorite food, and a chance to donate to the United Way or the Milverton Food Bank, all in the spirit of John's love for life and for fun. Next Sunday, we look forward to a service of welcome for new members. And if you'd like any more information about that, please talk to Kara. Kids for Christ is coming up again on October 30th. So mark your calendar for that if there's children in your life. There's an opportunity to donate washcloths and soap for Operation Christmas Child boxes. I noticed a box out in the foyer for that. Please bring those by November 12th. And also remember to order apple dumplings, which are also, also benefiting Operation Christmas Child. And pick up for them is this Wednesday at Cross Hill Mennonite. There's lots more in the information sheet. And thank you, Susan, for keeping us on top of everything. Now we turn to worship. This fall's worship series on the Reimagining Church Road is about wonderings and questions. Over these past weeks, we've reflected upon new nets that Jesus may be inviting us to cast, on how we do things rather than on what we do. We've considered faith as a marathon race, and another week on ourselves as living stones. And this week, our focus will be sometimes the learning is hard. We know that important lessons come through difficult experiences. As people of faith, we are lifelong learners. So as we begin, let's take some time to reflect, to open our hearts to what God is showing us today.
Yep. We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually vibrant, alive, productive. As we abide in Christ, Christ's words will abide in us. We come because we strive to be faithful disciples. We gather for worship now to the glory of God who is able to do far more beyond all that we could ask or imagine by the Spirit's power at work within us. Please pray with me. God, we are grateful for your Spirit, always nudging us to learn and to grow. And we are grateful for this community of sisters and brothers in faith in which we are nurtured and challenged. Speak to us this morning, God as we continue to walk your way together. Amen. To invite those who are leading us in music this morning to come. Good morning. Please join us in singing uh, song, uh, hymn number one, Summoned by the God Who Made Us. And if you're able, please stand. <clears throat>
from the Old Testament. I'm reading this morning from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43. I'm going to read this short passage in two different versions, first from the Common English Bible and then from the New Revised Standard Version. And I'd invite you to, to pause and reflect on the words in between the two readings. Don't remember the prior things. Don't ponder ancient history. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? I'm making a way in the desert, paths in the wilderness. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let's sing again. Singing hymn number 30. This is a new one to us, so I'm going to play it through once and then we're going to join in all together. <clears throat> and please stand. Yes, you can stand too. Thank you. Um. So this is the beginning, or the introduction.
A reading from chapter 15 of the Gospel according to John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch that withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. So have you ever learned a lesson the hard way? Maybe the better question is, when's the last time you learned a lesson the hard way? Now, I'm not going to ask anyone to come clean about the lesson you learned, but I expect it's pretty accurate to say that we've all attended the School of Hard Knocks from time to time. And I expect we've all been bruised or humbled and maybe even sulked a bit when we learned a lesson the hard way. Sometimes the learning is hard. Now, this story is just too fresh to not share with you, and I do so with permission from Jeanette, who came into the church over a week ago frantic to find a USB stick similar to this one belonging to the guest speaker from the women's event. Jeanette knew she had put it in her pocket. Retracing her steps, she looked high and low. She looked through bags and pockets, even the recycling bin. She didn't come into the church just once, but twice, hunting for this tiny little computer gadget with an orange case. I promised Jeanette if I came across it, I would let her know. Well, lo and behold, last Sunday, just as we were ready to head home, my dear hubby told me he found something suspicious. He asked Johnny about it, who told him it's garbage, so it got tossed. And when hubby told me, including the description, well, my antennas were up. So off he went to dig through the garbage, and guess what? The lost, now destroyed, USB stick was found. But next came the investigation. Where did you find it? Well, it happened to be right outside the back office door in the parking lot. And sure enough, when we searched, we found some orange shards, leftovers from the case. I left the bits on my office desk and sent Jeanette a text. So this past Tuesday, Jeanette popped by again, and she told me that her and Jaden had just recently had quite another kerfuffle when Jaden happened to lose her full set of keys which cost several hundred dollars to replace, of course, with some parental guidance, and perhaps it was more of a maternal gentle lecture, she told Jaden, don't ever put anything in your pocket, it's going to get lost. I think it might be fun to ask Jaden how he responded to his mother's dilemma when it was her who lost something out of her pocket. Sometimes the learning is hard. Friends, we are human. Our God knows we are human. Perfection is a myth. Progress is good. But the reality is we all mess up. We lose things. We say words that can't be taken back. We act in ways that cannot be undone. We don't always show up our best self. I see a few grins out there. We drive too fast. We might miss an important event. We might even be convinced our way is right and everyone else is wrong, and we learn the hard way. Or at least I do. 
Our sacred story doesn't gloss over the missteps, the messes, or the mislearning opportunities of God's people as they are confronted with holy presence, the goodness and the grace of God. So let's consider Nicodemus the Pharisee, whom we encounter in John chapter 3. Highly trained, educated Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness. He, he manages to acknowledge Jesus' skill as a teacher from God, to which Jesus responds, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. The conversation begins in earnest, but things quickly go sideways. Not only does Nicodemus not understand what Jesus is talking about, but he can barely keep up with the discussion, nor comprehend what Jesus is saying. What do you mean being born again? How is that even possible? Nicodemus can't make sense of earthly things Jesus is talking about, and Jesus seems to understand that speaking to Nicodemus about heavenly things is likely not going to go any better. So he talks to him about the Israelites, who learned the hard way about having faith and trusting the Lord. Amidst 40 years of wilderness wandering, the Lord instructed the Israelites to lift up a bronze snake. Do you remember that Old Testament story? Which Jesus compares to the Son of Man being lifted up so that everyone who sees will also be saved. Surely it was this point that Nicodemus walked away with a serious brain cramp. Now, it should come as no surprise to us that Nicodemus would leave completely confused. I think I would have, too. But when we read the entirety of John chapter 3, we notice Nicodemus isn't mentioned again. Nicodemus had to learn what he truly needed to know the hard way. As a Pharisee, surely he was around when Jesus was arrested, tried, beaten, sent to Pilate, condemned, crucified, and buried. And while the Gospels don't mention his presence by name, it shouldn't surprise us that he was there. All the Pharisees were. And when Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate to request the body of Jesus, Nicodemus asked to help Joseph place Jesus' broken body in the garden tomb. So what do you think? Would Nicodemus have done that if he was the same person who had visited Jesus at night with all of his questions. Not unlike the Israelites, Nicodemus doubted the Lord. The Israelites learned the hard way, Nicodemus learned the hard way, we learn the hard way. And if we need even further proof, we need only look to the disciples. For three years, the disciples accompanied Jesus as he traveled throughout the Galilee, healing, teaching, casting out demons, performing miracles. The 12 witnessed Jesus heal blind eyes with spit, restore the hearing of a deaf man by putting his fingers in his ear. They were present when a woman anointed Jesus' feet, which set off quite a kerfuffle with the local religious leaders. The disciples thought they knew how the world works. A day's pay for a day's work. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Pay unto Caesar what is Caesar's. They had no framework to understand the manifestation of holy presence and goodness and the grace of God amongst them in the flesh. Sometimes the learning is hard. But the necessity of unlearning is a challenge Jesus faced as he taught about the reign of God. Over and over, Jesus would say, You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. You have heard that it was said, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, but I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those 
who persecute you. Not only did the disciples face the challenge of learning, they faced a bigger challenge of unlearning. People of God grounded in Torah and tradition were faced with unlearning, as were the marginalized, the religious leaders, the powerful, the poor. The wisdom of God wasn't neatly wrapped up in a coarse syllabus nor bound in weighty textbooks. Jesus embodied God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven when he shared table fellowship with tax collectors and sex workers. He embodied the reign of God when he centered his ministry, not on the wealthy and powerful, but on those whom society said were unworthy of belonging. One of the significant behaviors that created absolute chaos for Jesus' critics was his insistence that everyone mattered. And Jesus didn't just say it, he lived it. Touching the leper, embracing the outcast, extending forgiveness, keeping company with women, and more. Pastor and author Mark Batterson suggests that half of learning is learning. Makes sense. The other half of learning is unlearning. And unfortunately, unlearning is twice as hard as learning. What do you think? Would you agree? Well, he goes on to say, half of spiritual growth is learning what we don't know. The other half is unlearning what we do know. Spiritual growth is learning what we don't know. The other half is unlearning what we do know. Now, I expect that each one of us, as Jesus' original 12, have been confronted time and again with opportunities to unlearn things we thought we knew or things we've taken for granted and don't even think about. Unlearning happens when our certainties and certitudes begin to unravel or challenged with new learnings. And it can be enough to soften us, mold humility. Depending upon our personality type, it might stir some shame. It might even poke hard at our pride. But when you think about it, when the learning has been hard or you've been on the path of unlearning, are those not the times that have taught you the most about yourself, about others, about God? Are those not the times that you have reevaluated, reflected, have been transformed, and experienced spiritual growth as you integrate those new learnings into your daily living? This theme of learning and unlearning took on new meaning for me this week as I prayed with John 15, one of Jesus' parting teachings to his disciples. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. My heavenly parent removes all, sorry, removes any of my branches that don't produce fruit and trims any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. Now, for those of us who grew up on a farm or have some gardening experience or might know a few things about pruning, it makes sense to prune branches that aren't producing fruit. Makes sense. Trimming branches that do produce fruit so they'll produce even more? Well, this also makes sense. But for someone who doesn't know anything about farming or vineyard dressing or orchard tending, cutting off productive branches, this makes no sense. In fact, it sounds quite stupid. Jesus' teachings only emerge as wisdom when we've done the homework of studying scripture, when we've been engaging in our spiritual practice of abiding in the vine, when we live with openness to new learnings and unlearning and new learnings. So whether you are for 
or 64 or 94. You are a lifelong learner. Philippians 1 verse 6 reminds us that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this fall, we've been journeying the reimagining church road. So how does claiming our identity as lifelong learners impact this journey? Well, firstly, we are all on this road. Secondly, we do well to pay attention to the caution signs along the way. One particular caution sign alerts us that the ground beneath our feet is being rearranged and shifting. Now, be sure the ground isn't collapsing and there are no total washouts. The ground is shifting. And this is good when we are attentive because it means that we will be aware the foundation beneath our feet is more truthful, more grace-filled, more just. Jesus' teachings rearranges a worldview ground steeped in a story that privileges the powerful over a few. It shifts worldview ground, widening the bounds of who matters to include everyone Jesus loves. And if we're keeping score, that means everyone, especially those whom society has long oppressed, pushed aside, or silenced. So can you bring to mind a time when the ground beneath your feet seemed to shift and you faced unlearning? Can you think of a time? I think you're going to explore that question in your adult Christian ed time today. I grew up with a strong Anabaptist work, work ethic that meant if I worked hard enough and never misstepped, I could earn God's love. That's what I grew up believing. But that's something I have unlearned over the years, having encountered the grace of God. I've also learned a lot about grace from you over these past 12 years, which I am eternally grateful for. Transitions of all kinds cause the ground to shift. When I was gathering research for my doctoral work, a colleague said, we don't know who we are. A long-standing partnership with a community ministry had come to an end, and the congregation was asking, who are we now in the community? What is it to unlearn an identity? The Apostle Paul's relationship with the resurrected Jesus enabled Paul to unlearn what his society and culture told him was important. As Nicodemus saw was a highly trained, educated man, a Pharisee. And his commitment to persecute the followers of Jesus was resolute. His actions fit within a framework of his first century understanding, his theology, his life experience, his training and education and more. An unexpected encounter with the resurrected Christ on a very different reimagining road, unraveled everything. The ground shifted. The light blinded. A voice from heaven was heard saying, So, why are you harassing me? I am Jesus. Surely the witnesses were speechless. Surely they had a brain cramp. As, as did Ananias in Damascus when he received this divine message from God telling him, you're going to take in Paul. But isn't he the one who's wreaking chaos? Didn't he come here to take those people as prisoners? Divine unlearning, disruptive unraveling. Paul was given a new mission and a new calling. So what is the Spirit's invitation to us at this time and at this place on the reimagining church road? What learning the hard way is underway? 
Are we learning? We don't have all the answers. We don't know with certainty what are the next steps. Well, nor should we, friends. It's called walking by faith and trust, secure in the embrace and the mission and the calling of God. What unlearning through branch trimming is underway? But we've always done it this way, we might say. Or our structure says, friends, this can become heavy and burdensome baggage for our journey. So what needs to be unlearned and released in order to travel lightly? What unproductive and productive branches might we be clinging to which Jesus wants to prune so that congregational life may be even more fruitful? What certitudes, convictions, or our need for stability needs some pruning? These are important questions for us to be praying with. See, I am doing a new thing, says the Lord our God. Even now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The disciples' lives were transformed having encountered the divine. The Apostle Paul's life was transformed for having encountered divine presence and the goodness and the grace of God. And he offers us this prayer as recorded in Ephesians 3. Let's say this together. Glory to God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in, in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and always. Amen. So today you get a homework assignment. And it's this. May we commit to praying these words of Paul, who learned the hard way and, un and learned that unlearning is twice as hard. And may we walk in the light of God, source of all wisdom, learning and unlearning, for this is who God has created us for. Amen. Please join us in singing uh, hymn number 522, O Blessed Spring. And please stand if you may, are able. <coughs> Sorry, just a second here.
to invite the ushers forward to receive this morning's offering and invite all of us to pray together. God, through all the seasons of life, you are with us, providing for us and asking us to look out for our neighbors, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, as a sign of our love for you. God, bless these gifts that we bring this morning as they fuel the ministries of our church and of your work in this world. Amen. pray together. Lord Jesus, true vine, in our need we come to you. Amidst the troubles and the sufferings of the world, we come to you. Teach us to remain in you and to find your life flowing in us, providing strength and trust and resilience. Trim away all that is unproductive in our lives and your church. Prune also that which is productive so that fruit born will be even more plentiful. The fruit of peace, love, justice, goodness, generosity. As we am Abide in the embrace of your life-flowing love. May your wisdom inspire ongoing learning and unlearning as we grow as disciples of healing and hope. We come this morning, hearts heavy with images of violence we have seen on the news, places of fear and terror, places of war where human suffering and the disregard for human life is deep and broad. Oh, how you must weep. 
Our hearts turn to the land you called holy, where missiles rain down death and destruction, chaos and terror. We pray today for Israelis, for Palestinians. And because you teach us to pray for enemies, we pray for Hamas terrorists. For those who are fleeing, we pray for sanctuary. For those who are staying, safety. For those who are fighting, Lord, how do we pray? For those whose hearts are breaking, we pray for comfort. For those who see no future, hope. God of peace, prune back all that stands in the way of peace. We pray for people in leadership and power who have decisions to make, which impact world peace and the well-being of so many. We pray for our nation and its leaders. May changes and decisions be shaped by the values of your kingdom. We also pray for those in need in our church and community. Wherever hearts are breaking, bodies failing, minds troubled, families and relationships conflicted, loads too heavy to bear, Lord, come with your help and healing your compassion, loving kindness, and grace. Lord Jesus, true vine, in our need we abide in you. Amidst the troubles and sufferings of the world, you faithfully abide with us. As your followers desiring to walk in your ways, we offer our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, we are going to try a new song. Uh, it's hymn number 568 in your hymnal. Christ has no body here but ours. It is, uh, I am going to again play through it once. The verse at the beginning repeats twice and then there is the chorus so i'm playing it through twice and then we'll sing and then you'll hear the chorus and then we will sing so please stand please stand thank you <laughs>
into this world we go with kindness and with God's blessing. Go in peace.